Sebastian is here from uh, the College of um, Agriculture. He's with the um, Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics. So we'll turn it over to Sebastian. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so I have a bit of a cold, so if you hear kind of a strange a French German accent, you can blame it uh, on the cold, but this is a Canadian accent. Okay. But is it no, seriously, if there's something you know you don't you don't hear well or you want me to repeat or bleep, stop me and uh, uh, we'll go from there. So there are two parts of this presentation. So we'll present more the economics of the leases and Paul, which is teaching now, is uh, on his way, we'll talk more about the legal issues, okay, the zoning and so on. So Paul is more the, is the, is the liar and me, I'm the, the economist. Uh, so this is a two-act uh, show. So I'll do, a, a, no, what I want to do, I'll do a short introduction, discuss the policies, why you see people coming here, you know, what are the market trends uh, that push uh, energy uh, developers to come and knock on your door. So I want to give you a bit of background and discuss that. And then I'll dive in the detail of the, the leases, uh, where the money is coming from, uh, and the various, you know. I will try to give you a sense of whether or not this is, uh, you know, the leases or the, the, the amount that they offer to you is a fair, fair amount, basically, for, for what this is worth. Okay, uh, caveat or disclaimer. So this is not about the cost benefit of uh, you know, s renewable energy. You know, I don't know anything about the, the costs uh, on you of those leases. Okay, so it depends really on the, the value of the land, the aesthetic value, uh, what you think uh, the land should be valued or used for. What I will try to do is the benefit of those leases. So how much money you can earn from those leases. And I will try to quantify the uncertainties related to the flow of revenues that you can earn from those leases. Uh, and this is where I will focus. So this is really not a cost benefit. So I, I'm not taking any stand of whether or not this is a good thing, uh, you know, whether or not you should sign those leases. And also, okay, I will use, uh, have a small simulation where I present numbers. That is coming from a small sample of leases that I've seen. Uh, so you might have seen different numbers. So don't take those numbers as face value. This is just to illustrate uh, what is going on uh, there. Okay, just to dive a little bit on the cost-benefit uh, aspect of that, if you, you know, when you will decide or if you are facing the decision to, to sign a lease, well, you should just balance, not just, but you should balance the benefit and the cost. And what are the benefits? Well, you know, they will offer, offer you some revenue associated to those leases. And this is where this is the main benefit of signing those leases. A bit of cost savings from not cultivating the farmland and in the case, in the case of solar and a bit less from wind, but there are maybe multi-use multi of the land that you can do. Uh, there are projects that you do increase pollination with uh, you know, where you install a solar uh, operation. So that is on the benefit side, and there are a lot of costs associated to that. You know, the main one is the lost revenue from productive uh, farmland. Aesthetic value, some people think that this is not looking very nice to have those big operations, the wind uh, wind turbine or the solar panel. There are some impact on local local ecosystem, noise, fire risk, so on and so forth. But yes. The fire risk. What, what would that? Be? Well, no. Let's say fr from uh, from the wind turbine. Once in a while, and there's a small percentage percentage of you know of that. But sometimes they just break down and they can catch on fire, and that okay. small probability, but it has happened. Uh, the the glare from a panel also might increase the, the risk and so on. I won't discuss any of that, so the probability of that happening, I'm not too sure. Uh, so, you know, this is part of the cost, you should be aware of that, but I, I won't give you any numbers there because I'm not aware of really those numbers. But what I will focus in the, is on the, the first box, the lifetime, so the benefit side of those leases. And, okay, of course the goal is that you having a better understanding of that will help you to balance all those costs and benefits and make a better decision. Okay, so this is the goal of this presentation. <coughs> okay, so what I want to do next is to discuss a couple of uh, renewable policies to understand why this is important and why this is happening now, market trends. Uh, and then I will make a small detour to uh, explain how the electricity market works in Maryland. So I've, I bet that you know pretty well 
how the agricultural market work and how you sell grain and the, the value, you know, supply and demand for uh, grain and uh, uh, you know, farm, farm stock. Here, this is really important, you know, I, I want to give you a sense of how this, how this is working because the revenue that you might get from the leases might depend on the inner working of the electric, electricity market in Maryland. This is complicated, but I just want to take maybe a 10, 15 minutes to make a small detour and give you an overview of the players and where the money is coming from. And then I will dive, discuss the wind lease and solar lease. Although that, you know, I know that the issue here is more, mostly about solar, they are those type of lease are different in, the, in general, and you know, wind lease tend to be a bit more complicated. I just want to explain that first because I will do a thought experiment with the solar lease to explain whether or, no, whether or not I think the solar lease are a fair value, and I will use some of the structure of the wind lease to do that thought experiment. So hang on there, I'll, I'll go in more details and explain what, what I'm doing uh, there. Okay, so first in terms of policy, just a, a quick overview. One of the main reasons why people are knock, knocking on your door these days to uh, install renewable energy is because the state has a renewable portfolio standard. What does it mean? So the state has a mandate to have 20% of all electricity consumed in the state be from renewable sources by 2022. And from that, 2% is should be from solar, uh, by 2020, okay? That is about uh, 1,200 megawatt. And some of that is from offshore wind. So how it works, I mean, the mandate means that energy suppliers must uh, guarantee that all the electricity that they sell, X percent of it, so now it change every year, this is ramping up to 20%, but X percent of it is coming from renewable sources. How far are we from this goal? So, <clears throat> so let's focus on solar. So we have this 2% goal. That is the cumulative installation of solar in megawatt uh, as of 2014. So this is 150. That's the goal of RPS. So we have a long way to, you know, to go. And so you know, energy developers are really looking to install more solar in the state because we have this big gap in solar to, you know, to, to cover and to meet, to meet the renewable portfolio standard in the state. Okay? So now the, the activity that you see in the solar industry in the state, this is just starting, basically. So that issue is becoming, will be you know, bigger and bigger, and you will see more and more uh, energy developer trying to find any type of lands, any type of project where they can install solar, agricultural land, commercial, uh, rooftop, you know, residential houses, all that count into that 2% uh, goal, okay? So 2% seems really small, but that's, that's quite a bit, okay? That's quite a bit of work that uh, we need to, to do uh, to get there. Okay, so the renewable portfolio standard include wind, solar, but also things like hydro, biomass, solid, land wa solid waste, landfill, and so on. Things that, you know, might also affect you uh, in anaerobic dig dig digestion, so this is a project that uh, you could do on, on, uh, on farms. Let me tell you a bit more about how a renewable portfolio standard, okay, aside the RPS was, uh, was uh, there was a goal to extend from 20 to 25, uh, with the goal to extend from 2 to 2.5% for solar, but the bill was vetoed by the governor last, uh, last March or April, last, last April, I believe. Uh, so we'll see, maybe there's a push to increase that, uh, maybe the legislation will revisit that. Okay, so let me tell you a bit more how the RPS is working. So you have energy supplier, which is Pepco, Delmarva, BG, uh, direct energy, you know, the P people that uh, sometimes are calling you to change uh, your service provider. All those people are selling electricity to the final consumers, residential, commercial, industrial. So when they sell electricity, they need to show that they own credits coming from renewable sources. So what it means, an energy generator Okay, someone that generates energy from renewable sources. For every unit of energy, they get a certificate saying, okay, 
have produced one megawatt of electricity coming from renewable sources. So this is a credit, a certificate, and that certificate is being sold to energy supplier. So energy supplier needs to own the right on those certificate to meet the RPS goal. Simple example, BGE, but more gas and electric, sell 100 units of electricity in a given year. BGE must have 20 renewable energy credit, 20%, okay, if the RPS is 20%. So BGE must have 20 renewable energy credit, so that 20% of the electricity that uh, it sells in a given year is guaranteed or is proven to be from renewable sources. So what it means here, uh, so we have this credit, those credits, and those credits, there's a market for it in the state, and in fact there are other states around here that have also RPS, and those credits can, can also be sold across, across states. Okay, so that is important because renewable energy credit, the price of it changed over time, so there's a, a market, this is being traded, and the value of renewable energy is partly function of those renewable energy credit, because developer of renewable energy, they are being paid for each unit of electricity that they sell, and also for each renewable energy credit that they put in the system. Okay. What, um, yes. What would consist of a one unit of the electricity that we can What is what is that one unit? This is a. I just wanted to to make a Mickey Mouse example. Hun units is a megawatt hour here. A megawatt hour. Yeah. So in, in reality, you know, BGE sell uh, I don't know three megawatt hour, megawatt. Uh, I don't you know a given unit. But here, this is just to give an example. Hundred twenty. It makes twenty percent. But the unit of electricity that we are talking about here is our megawatt, kilowatt hour, or uh, megawatt hour. Just to give you a sense of <coughs> what is going on with the market for renewable energy credit, those are prices over time for different regions. So you have Maryland somewhere there. Uh, you have uh, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. This is mostly Northeast. Uh, and I just want to show you that there is a lot of variation over time, and there's a lot of variation across regions. So the price that you are, you know, that the energy developer gets from those credits is highly volatile. Okay. And nowadays, the price is uh, around 40, uh, 45 um, dollar per megawatt hour of uh, electricity produce. Okay, what is a megawatt? What is one megawatt? When you know a solar developer come on your your land, usually they will offer you know solar. I would call it solar farm or solar operation that range in size from one to two, three megawatt. Okay, so that's about the size. One megawatt will produce enough electricity for about 2,500 homes. Okay, so that's that's the scale of those numbers. Okay, so. This is RPS, this is a big policy, and this is one of the main reasons why there's a lot of interest for installing or developing solar uh, energy in the state. There are other policies at the federal and state level that encourage the uh, installation or adoption of solar uh, and wind, wind energy. There is a federal production uh, tax credit for wind, there is a federal investment tax credit for wind and solar, and there are state incentives that just stopped in 2015. Uh, so this is for a production incentive uh, offered by the state. Those are important policies and also a big driver of you know, why you see more investment. But the RPS is really the big policy there. And finally, even without those policies, the other reason why there's a lot of interest for solar, that is the cost. You know, you don't have to read the number. I just want to show you the scale of the change in cost per megawatt uh, install of solar energy. And this is coming from $70 to point, no, 70 cents here, over, a, forgot, over about a 30, uh, 40 years horizon. And here, I mean, the last 10 years, the cost of solar just went, you know, decreased by half. And there, is, there are big trends, basically, in the market and the technology. We are just because, you know, uh, becoming better and better at finding ways to produce solar panel and the cost is going down. So now what is happening? Soon the cost of producing electricity from electricity will be as cheap as natural gas, 
uh, fossil fuel and so on. So there are market trends that, you know, policies are there to push for solar energy, but there are market trends that are also there and push uh, for solar energy. So that's, that is happening and this is why also we are here today. Okay, a couple of technical terms that I'll be using throughout the remaining of this presentation and this is important to understand, uh, know the leases uh, and the, the revenue coming from those leases. So we have, you know, how you, describe, how you describe the size of a solar operation or wind operation is with what we call capacity factor. And when we say, okay, here this is a one megawatt solar operation, we call it that the nameplate capacity. So this is the full energy potential of the wind or solar resource. In reality, a one megawatt solar operation will never produce, you know, if it runs throughout all the hours in a given year, it will not produce 8,000 whatever number of hours in a year times one megawatt in a given year. It will just produce a fraction of that and we call it the gross capacity factor. Okay, gross capacity factor is when you, because okay, why you cannot uh, get the full potential of a wind on solar resource? Wind is not blowing all the time and sun is not shining all the time, okay? And then from the growth capacity factor, there are a number of things such as the production disruption. Sometimes you have maintenance, sometimes the, the wind or the solar uh, operation will break down, so you have to fix that. So you have some adjustment for production disruption, so we will call that from growth capacity factor, we'll call that the net capacity factor. And that is really, at the end, the amount of energy, the total amount of energy uh, that you get from a given operation. And the source of the disruption are you know, from different, different uh, causes, maintenance that, is, that are planned, you need to go there once in a while and uh, main, maintain the, the operation. Depreciation, so over time the wind turbine, the, you know, the motor, the rotor will uh, depreciate. Same thing with the solar panel. Breakdown, and finally, uh, there's a bit of congestion created by those resources in the electricity grid. <clears throat> The same way that too much cars on the road create congest congestion and slow uh, the flow of uh, traffic, if there is too much electricity being produced in a given amount of, you know, at a given point in time, uh, the system needs to shut down. You need to basically shut renewable uh, or energy from renewable operation to, to not have too much electricity in the system. So remember, with electricity, we cannot store that. So any electron sent in the grid must be consumed at, the, at any given point in time. So supply must equal demand at all point in time. What is the problem with renewable energy? Well, sometimes the wind is just blowing really hard and the sun is out there and you cannot, you know, it's not like coal or uh, natural gas that you can control your power plant. If the wind decides to, to, to blow really hard, you just have a lot of electricity. And if this is at the middle of the night when nobody is consuming, you have too much electricity in the system. So what it means, there's a system operator managing the market, the electricity market, that needs to curtail uh, those resources. Okay, just a couple of numbers. Gross capacity factor, yes? When they're controlling, do they have access to be able to control, shut this part down and allow this to come through, maybe depending on the contract, or is it across the board, everything slows at the same rate? No, they are, uh, no, so they are, uh, the system operator would basically ask uh, who, wants to, who wants to shut down now, and basically it's kind of a bidding process. The, some people say, okay, I'm, I'm good uh, stopping uh, producing now. Okay, so there's a bidding process that determines, uh, yeah. And at the end, I mean, you have cases that the prices of electricity go negative, so, you know, the system operator will pay producer to, to stop producing. Couple of numbers you know, that are important. Wind, the gross capacity factor is about 35% nowadays, solar 25, meaning that we are able to capture about 25% of a, you know, a solar operation that is built to capture one megawatt, one megawatt, we are able to capture about 25% of, of that, okay? Yeah, so, example, so I give an example. So, you know, numbers that are realistic that you might see. So if you have 10 acres of, la of land uh, for a solar operation, 
that might all about uh, a two megawatt operation. Okay, so the solar developer will say, okay, I would like to build a two megawatt uh, solar operation. So what it means, how much electricity will be produced there? Well, there are eight hours, no, 8,760 hours in a given year, in any year, in a given year, every year. So this is the number of hours we have. So from megawatt to megawatt hour, we have, okay, two times that number of hours. And how much electricity would be produced? 25% of that. Okay, so about 4,000 something megawatt will be produced in a given year. I should put an age here. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Quickly, wind, wind technology. <coughs> I just want to, to have two technical, you know, a couple of technical terms I'll be using. The hub height uh, referred to the, you know, from the ground to the middle of the, the router. And the router diameter, uh, what determine the total height is half of that di diameter. So hub height plus half of the diameter determine the total height of a wind uh, turbine. When wind is being installed, there are other technologies that come with the, the, the operation to measure kind of the wind resource locally. So a meteorological tower, a met tower, or a solar unit, those two things have the same purpose, basically to measure wind resource locally. Okay. Just want to give you a sense of what is happening in the wind, uh, wind market. The size of it, so I'm just, you know, the hub height is averaging about, you know, there's a trend, and this is how the technology is improving for wind. Uh, the trend is to have higher and higher wind turbine, and this is how you can capture more wind. And now the average is about uh, 100. Uh, is it meter? Yeah. So, yeah, 100 meters is about the average hub height uh, nowadays. And the uh, capacity for that is about 2, two megawatts. And the gross capacity factor is changing over time, but this is about 35% these days. So why this is important that you know that? Because the leases that they offer is based on assumption about the gross capacity factor. And so I just want you to know that, okay, 35%, which is the number that is being used by renewable energy developer, is a national average, and this is a realistic no number, okay? Last thing that I want to discuss uh, before starting to dive in the economic of those leases, what about curtailments? I discussed those uh, congestion issues. Is it a big deal, a small deal? Here in uh, Maryland, we are in the Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland electricity market. In the last couple of years, about 2% of the wind that was generated uh, had to be curtailed because it was, creating it was creating congestion. So there's a little bit of that going on. It's not that big, but this is you know, an adjustment that we should be uh, taking into account when we think about the value of those resources. I'll go back and discuss how I use that number a bit later. Well, aside, what is, what is the, the big blue at the beginning? That is Texas. Texas is the state that have installed the most wind, <coughs> great wind resource in Texas. So they rush and they install a, a lot of wind and to be, you know, to be honest, initially it seems that they didn't know exactly how to deal with all that resource. And so they had a lot of congestion going on and so they had to curtail wind resource quite a bit, up to almost 20%. Uh, but you see that they have learned how to better manage the resource, and nowadays, you know, if you look at the latest, later, latest year, they are you know, below 1%. Okay, so it was an issue, but it seems that now the system operators are better at you know, dealing with renewable uh, resources. For wind lease, they will pay you as a function of how much energy is produced, but also the size of the operation. There are two types, uh, you know, when you install a wind turbine, this is the area that will contain the, the wind turbine. So they call that the direct, direct impacted area. And you know, they will make a payment as a function of number of acres that are directly impacted. But when you have a, a wind operation, you know, you have a bunch of uh, wind turbine and all the small dots uh, above represent, uh, you know, let's say a given wind turbine. And so you, the total impacted area on the farmland would be quite bigger, okay? 
And so you, you need to be careful that when you look at leases, if it comes to, to you for a win, uh, what is, you know, are the payment function of the direct impacted area or total area? Of course, the total area is much larger, so you, know, you, look, you need to look at the uh, fine, prints, fine prints and distinguish between okay, those two type of uh, uh, area that would be impacted by the installation of a win operation. Okay, so on average, and this is hectare here, but one hectare is about 2.5 uh, acre. On average, a wind operation utility scale uh, would be about 20 hectare, so let's say uh, 50 acres. So this is taking quite a bit of uh, space. Uh, solar operation or smaller. Okay, so for 10 acres, you, you might have a one, two megawatt hour, megawatt uh, operation. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> wind will take about four, five times uh, uh, more space to produce the same amount of, uh, of energy. For wind, we don't see the same cost trends. So this is not the you know, last solar that we see a big decrease. Costs are decreasing, but the trends are not as uh, pronounced that we see for solar. OK, so one more figure. And uh, so yeah, I should have. Uh, can make that a bit bigger. And finally, the last or one of additional reason why we see a lot, you know, a lot of interest for uh, renewable energy and an important trend that need to be considered in this market is what is happening with natural gas. That is the price of natural gas. Five dollar is here, but you see that since you know in the last couple of years we see a big decrease in natural gas. I'm sure that you have heard about the big debate about fracking. What is happening? Well, there was this great technology uh, discovery, fracking, that can allow to extract now new resources of type of oil and natural gas that we were not able to do before that. And so now in the US, we have an over, almost overabundance of natural gas, it's something really hard to export to other countries. So now there's a lot of natural gas in the US. That has decreased the price of natural gas quite a bit. And that is driving down the price of electricity in the whole country. Why is this important? Now coal uh, is fading away, not because of regulation and all those things, because natural gas is now a better, you know, a cheaper energy source than coal. Okay. And now, you know, to which extent renewable energy is able to com compete with fossil fuel has to do with how cheap natural gas will become or stay. Okay. So now there's this game between you know, renewable energy and natural gas, uh, or this competition this, uh, that is happening. Uh, and whether or not you know, renewable energy will integrate fast in the market has to do with what would happen with the price of natural gas. OK, so I'm done with you know, the goal of what I did was to give you an overview of why it's happening, why we have a lot of uh, solar company or wind developer coming here and that want to install uh, uh, those resources. Now I just want to take maybe 10-ish 10, 10 minutes to discuss the electricity market in Maryland. This is, this is complicated, there's a lot of uh, subtlety, but I just want to give you a sense of what is going on so that you understand where the money is coming from. First, you should know that in 96, something happened at the federal level. The market for electricity got deregulated. Okay, so it was uh, uh, an order that was, uh, that was at the federal level. And a couple of states started deregulating their electricity market. Okay, that is the state of deregulation. In green means that the state, the electricity market were degraded. Yellow, it means that they started, they didn't finish it. White means that this is not deregulated. There was a big crisis in California uh, due to the deregulation, and that basically created the wind chill for the effort to deregulate electricity markets. So since then, really the, the bad experience of California really froze a lot of the effort to deregulate the electricity market. Long story short, we are in Maryland, and we are living in the deregulated, deregulated electricity market. So what it means? It used to be that you had Delmarva, BGE, Pepco, that will own generators, so they will produce electricity. They will own transmission line and distribution. 
Okay, so the whole vertical structure of the industry was owned by one firm. And you, when you will pay your bills, uh, you will pay for all the costs that the, the, the firm, the natural monopoly in this case, uh, was incurring. Now what happened with degradation? Generators are not being owned anymore by uh, the firm that own transmission and distribution. So now BGE, uh, Pepco, and so on, they are not the owner uh, of, gener no, of the old generation facilities. So the wind developers, solar developers, are now our generators, and they are participating in a competitive market. It means that they will you know, sell their resource, electricity, in a market, and this is a bidding process. The lowest cost bidder uh, win, and get get it its electricity in the system. So how it, how it works? Now we have generators and we have consumers. Okay? We have local utility which is the Delmarva and the, 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 the people that we that we know. Alternative energy suppliers are new players in this market. Who are they? Have you heard about direct energy or you know, people calling you at 630 uh, uh, every night to say, hey, would you like to change your service provider? Those are, you know, energy supplier. Actually, they don't own anything, generators or transmission line or distribution line. They are just financial player here. So they are just signing contracts to sell and buy electricity. And in the middle of that, you have a system operator, okay, that basically sit there and see how much demand do we have today, how much supply do we have, and balance supply and demand and using the law of the market. Okay, so nothing has changed in terms of the flow of electrons. Generators produce electricity, put that in a transmission line. Local utility have you know, distribution line and that gets to consumer, residential, commercial, industrial. Now what has changed is where the money is coming from. And this is the flow of money. And basically now, consumers can buy electricity from alternative energy suppliers or your local utility. You can change and pay one or the other. Uh, and all those players buy electricity in a centralized market, or they can have long-term contract also with generators. Okay, so this is those bigger. So ge generators participate, participate in, a day, in a daily market for electricity, the spot market, or they have long-term contract with local utility and alternative energy suppliers. And now with renewable energy, you can become, you know, uh, also pay yourself in, in some sense uh, by having uh, uh, solar panel on your roof, let's say. And now with renewable energy developer, we have a new player, okay, that will pay, that will come. So this is a, a, a generator. And those, no, you become basically a generators, you, you become part of the, the system. And where, why do you receive money? Well, basically you receive a royalty from the renewable energy developer. Okay, so that is where the money is coming from. Those people are generators in this big system. And those people receive money from having long-term power purchase agreement with local utility, alternative energy supplier, and some consumers. So sometimes like Google will have long-term purchase agreement with renewable energy supplier. So this is one way they get money, and part of that money that they receive will be passed to you with royalty. On top of that, there are the RECs, the Renewable Energy Credits. So they receive money from that because of the RPS policy. So this is the second floor from you that they receive. And finally, there is a day-to-day -day market for electricity, and they can participate in that and receive money from that. So to summarize, renewable energy developer can receive money from the spot market, long-term contract, and credit, renewable energy credits. So now there are some type of lease that say, okay, I will pay you 3% of how much money I'm making selling electricity. How much money they are making depends on the price of the renewable energy credit and the price that they get from long-term contract or the spot market price of electricity. So for some type of leases, the amount of royalty will vary over time because it is, this is based on those three sources of revenue. 
Any question at this point? So what I will do next, I'll just dive. I see, no? Okay, I'll just dive and explain in detail one wind lease, which are more complex in design, but give you a, you know, I haven't seen the solar lease uh, using that type of, uh, of clause, but they'll be useful also to under, to, once we get the, the hard part, we'll eat our broccoli, understand the wind leases, and then we'll discuss the solar lease. The when you mention the 3%, is that uh, wind or solar or both? The 2% goal for RPS is uh, for solar only. Yeah. Sebastian, how does that compare to other states of Maryland size? Is that an aggressive goal at 2% or uh, based on our land mass and what's available? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't have, yeah, I don't have a, a good sense. I, I, can, I, can, I can have the answer to that question. Uh, one of my students wrote his dissertation uh, looking at those things, so I just forgot. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. So the flow of from you, you know, that is, uh, okay, so that is, this is a disclaimer again. It's not a cost benefit. What I want to do here is to explain the flow of revenue uh, coming from uh, wind or solar lease. Okay, so how much money uh, those leases can can earn. So there are three important factors to consider, and I should you know this is for wind and solar lease. But first, when they present you those values, please just don't take you know ten thousand dollar a year, sum that, and say okay this is our you know. 20 times 10,000, this is how much this thing is, is worth. Please compute the net present value because money in the bank uh, is earning small interest and there's an opportunity cost of, of, of money, okay? So $10,000 today or $10,000 20 years from now doesn't have the same economic value. So you know, we should look at things in a net present value way. And so what I've seen in, uh, in leases it seems that to, to make it more appealing, they just sum those revenue over a very long horizon and they don't compute any net present value. So it seems that it's a really big number, but in reality, this is, you know, once you apply a small interest rate, uh, this is not uh, as big and shiny that it might uh, appear at, the, at first. Then, you know, when you think about those leases, uh, or when you look at those leases, the renewable energy developer, they don't tend to make any adjustment for production disruption. So the number that they, they provide tend to be over optimistic in terms of how much electricity can be produced because they don't account for those production disruption that, that are important and make uh, a big difference in how much revenue can be earned. And about prices also, they tend to be over optimistic about the, the magnitude uh, of the price for the wholesale electricity market and the REX price. So that should be taken into account also. <clears throat> so my main conclusion is when I you know, took a wind lease and I do those adjustments for net present value, adjustment for production and volatility in energy prices, what I'm finding is this is, you know, I will show you the structure of a wind lease, but they have basically a guarantee minimum payment that they offer, and they have a bigger payment that is function of what they will earn on the market. What I'm finding is once you do an you know, adjustment for production and uh, energy prices, this is very unlikely that the leases will pay you more than the minimum guarantee payment. So that you know, does it mean that that payment is bad? Okay, I'll show you some numbers. I think that this is kind of a, a fair value, but this is not as shiny or you know, positive that the leases seem to be, okay? Okay, so wind lease will have, and this is really similar for, you know, it should be solar and wind lease, but this is really similar in terms of uh, structure. There are payment, there are four stages, uh, uh, four parts to the lease and four type of payments associated to the leases. One is for the evaluation phase, the other for the installation and construction, third is for the energy production phase, and for the decommission. So how it works is say, they will say, okay, okay, you will sign a lease, and just after signing, they will go on your land and start evaluating uh, the resource, your land, and so on. Okay. I mean, they have already did a bit of scoping work, so they know kind of the, you know, what, they have a good idea before contacting you, but once this is signed, 
know, they will install, let's say, for wind, the MET tower or the solar unit to measure wind. Uh, for solar, they will, you know, look more carefully about uh, your land and so on. So there is a payment that is made for the evaluation. Okay, so there is the bonus, the sign, the the bonus uh, to sign the contract, and a small payment to access your land and evaluate the resource on your land. And then, if they, now they, you know, after that, they can walk out of the lease if they decide that actually this is not, uh, you know, it's not a good place to install a <coughs> renewable operation, or they can start installing and constructing the operation. That will take a couple of years, and then again, there are payment for for that. But the bulk of the payment is coming when they start energy production. I've seen leases of 50 years, 20 years for solar seems to be the norm, 30 for wind seems to be the norm. That is where the bulk of the payment of the leases are coming from. So that you know, energy production will start after evaluation and installation, so maybe five, no, three, five, seven years. And in fact, in this scenario, the maximum might be even 14 years after the, uh, you sign the, the contract. So now this $10,000 per acre, maybe the, fir no, the first payment of $10,000 per acre that you will see, uh, or $1,000 per acre, whatever, uh, would be maybe 10 years from now. So now this is why it's important to think that, okay, $10,000, the first payment that I will have for, you know, which is the bulk of the payment, would not be this year or tomorrow, would be 10 years from now. So how, how much is worth, no, how much is worth $10,000 10 years from now versus uh, next year? You should apply, you know, you should think that, you know, you should apply a small dis discount rate or interest rate to think uh, how much it's worth to you. And, that, and then finally, uh, there is the decommission. Uh, you know, those things last for the moment. When you know, solar farm, solar operation after 20 years, this is about the, the lifetime of the, the technology. 30 for win. Uh, at the end, they have to take that back, uh, and they will pay. They are they will pay for that. There are also other type of payments. Uh, installing those operations might increase the value of your property. Uh, in leases. That is taken into account, and they have property tax adjustment. So usually, the renewable energy developer will pay for those increase in property property taxes. Example: Wind lease signing bonus will be a thousand dollar, and then they will make an annual payment in the evaluation phase uh, for the dollar per acre. Acre, sorry that they will uh, disrupt. And this is where it's really important to be clear. Is it about the direct impacted area or the total area that the wind operation will affect? Because your, all your payment in the evaluation uh, stage will be function of the area that will be disturbed by the uh, operation. Okay. And then they will pay you a small amount, uh, what small, 1,500, let's say, a year if they install some technology, a MET tower or a solar unit. Uh, and that is for the evaluation uh, phase. Okay, so here, just a recommendation, just be clear in the lease, what is the area that they base the payment on? Is it the total area, which might be up to 20, 30 acre for wind, or is it just a direct impacted area? <clears throat> and then there is the installation phase, uh, and then they will pay you right when they start construction, so maybe half, uh, and this is, let's say, numbers that we have seen, 2,500 uh, per megawatt hour. Half of it uh, would be paid when they start construction, the other half when they, they just finish the construction. If they install uh, other facilities, build road, uh, anything, they will also pay, uh, and they will try to pay kind of the, the market value of the net. If you are part of an operation, let's say your neighbor is doing it, and you accept that the, a road leading to the wind operation pass on your land, they might pay you also participation fee, uh, which is also a function of the, there's a minimum, or, also, or this is a function of the number of acres that are being disturbed by that. All that are, I mean, this is, this is money, this is substantial payment, but most of the revenue are coming from the operation phase. Okay, so this is where it's just kind of interesting for wind. How they pay you is usually a function of, of how much electricity they produce, and they take a percentage of that, and they pay you that percentage. Okay, so this is a real royalty payment. 
uh, that is function of how much megawatt uh, hour is being sent in the grid and what is the price that they receive for that. Okay. So that they make that okay. They have this royalty payment and they have a mechanism that they call the minimum guarantee payment that cap the minimum payment. And in leases that we have seen, there is also another mechanism that's a little bit more obscure, but this is uh, a maximum payment, basically, that they have built in in the lease, such that suppose that the royalty payment is really high, there is something in the lease that basically they can do and max the amount that they can pay you. Okay, so w how it works, basically, is that you have a minimum and maximum payment that you can receive from that. And you have the royalty payment that goes in between this min and max. And that's an expectation how you, what you would receive from those wind leases. Example, royalty payment would be 3 to 5% of the gross revenue that they receive over time. What are the gross, where the gross revenue are coming from? The power price, okay? the price of electricity, how much we pay uh, per each megawatt hour in the system and the REX price, the Renewable Energy Credit. And the uh, developer will pay you if they enter a certain type of, uh, of contracts. So that is in the detail of the lease, but whether or not they pay the royalty depends on whether or not they have a long-term uh, power purchase agreement with uh, other stakeholders in the, in the system. And then you have the minimum guarantee payment, which is the fixed amount, let's say $5,000 per megawatt install that they pay you. So what they will do is they will see in a given year, is the royalty payment is above that, they will pay you the royalty payment. If the royalty payment dip below 5,000 per megawatt hour, they will pay you $5,000 per megawatt hour, per, per megawatt install. Sorry. Okay. So that is kind of a clause that is a bit more complicated that we have seen, but there's also the alternative rent. If for some reason the developer doesn't have a power purchase agreement, uh, he doesn't operate, the, doesn't have actual revenue from electricity or is in some strange partnership with the utility, they might decide to just pay you a maximum amount, which is $6,000 per megawatt install. So, Long story short is here the minimum and here the maximum and the lease basically cap the revenue that you can receive per megawatt installed between those two numbers. So it means that the real two payment, you know, one thing that you might think is if the power price or the REX price are going really high, I'll make a lot of money and my royalty payment will be really high. Well, actually, there is something in the in one clause in the, in the, in the lease that allow the renewable uh, energy developer to cap that royalty payment and basically uh, stop at $6,000 per megawatt. So you cannot benefit from the full spread or the full increase in power price or REX price because of this, this clause. Yes? Is that an annual So that, yeah, so that is a function of, yeah, 6,000 per megawatt uh, install. Sorry. The, so that would be times the number of hours, and uh, uh, yeah, I just let, let me give you the numerical example, and you will see uh, how it will work. Okay, so what I did is I did a small toy, mo toy model based on real numbers that we have seen. So let's say you have a hundred acre uh, wind operation. This is a total impact area, five acre direct total impact area, two megawatt install. 32% is the gross capacity factor. It takes five years to, uh, to evaluate uh, and construct the operation. Three years for the construction, five years after the construction is done. And you have 30 years of operation of the wind turbine. I would assume a 3% interest rate, what we see that nowadays, and a power price of $70 per megawatt hour, and inflation of 2.5. Under those scenarios for the evaluation phase, this is exactly the number that you will see on a wind lease. They will say, okay, that, and they do those simulation on, uh, on leases that we have seen. They say, okay, that, that contract will pay you about $6,000 for the evaluation, $5,000 for the installation, and then you have this big number, more than $700,000 for operation uh, phase. And the minimum guarantee payment under that contract would be a bit, you know, 400 
39,000. So this is the number that you see in the, in the wind lease. Now what I will do is, well, you know, those 30 years of operation, uh, you should discount those revenue across time. So I will apply the net present value. I will adjust for production disruption. Uh, and I will uh, adjust or create different scenario for different power price. But let's start with accounting for the net present value. And why the net present value? Well, again, any, I'm the economist here, but I don't want to lecture you on, on that. But any stream of revenue payable in the future shall be, sh should always be summed and discounted with a certain discount rate. This is the right way to make you know, good financial decision. Because one dollar today is, of course, worth much more than one dollar 10 years from now, because who knows where we'll be 10 years from now, OK? And that discount rate, now I'm using 3%. Uh, it could be 2%, 1%, 10%. It really depends how much you value the future or you don't value the future, OK? You, you know, in practice, you can take the discount trade that you make on your portfolio of assets. If you make a 5% on average, maybe this is the right discount rate that you want to, to use to compute the net present value. Why is it important to look at you know, net present value? If I discount, if I apply the net present value here to those numbers, the number that we see in the lease, 700, well, you know, if you apply a 5% discount rate, this is really, over the lifetime of that project, this is really worth, two, no, the benefit of that is really worth 200 plus $100,000. So what it means, when you think about your cost-benefit ratio, don't think, you know, you should not use a 700, you know, here are all the benefits that I'm making. If I think that this is a discount rate that apply to, you know, to me, 5%, well, the cost should be below 200000 you know, 250, something like that, or 500 if this is 1.5, not $700,000. So this is really important to have a realistic view of those benefits and apply the right discount, uh, discount rate. And you no, know, same thing, the minimum payment is much lower once you account for the net present value. Okay, what I want to do next is to account for production disruption. Uh, you have maintenance, curtailment, declining production over time because the technology is being used and so on. So now I'm just using numbers from various uh, scientific studies. Uh, so I'm making kind of conservative adjustment for production disruption. And this is for wind? Or? This is for wind. And what I want to show you here is that is applying the net present value. That is the number that you see in the leases. And that is applying the net present value and the production disruption adjustment. Key thing is that the royalty payment here is getting very, very close to the minimum payment. So now, you know, this big shiny royalty payment is, in fact, pretty close, would be pretty close in reality uh, to the minimum guarantee payment. Next thing, what about the power price? Power price that I've seen in leases uh, is the generate scenario with the $70 power price. That was before natural gas uh, went really low. Now we are living, and this is nationwide, power, pri power price are below $30. In, in, the, in the east, uh, this is a bit higher. Uh, but still, I mean, $70 for the, the price of, uh, you know, per megawatt for energy is a really optimistic view of no, our electricity will cost, uh, or pessimistic view, depends if you are a buyer or a seller, but you know, $70 is a really high price. So now, let's just reduce that price by $10, $60. And now you see already, the royalty payment is below the minimum payment. And now, my preferred price, which I think, you know, natural gas, we won't export that uh, anytime soon, so you know, I think we are living in low electricity price maybe for a little while, then you see the royalty payment is really below, quite a bit, the minimum payment. So it would be really hard for those leases to pay anything else than the minimum payment. Okay? So that's the main takeaway from that exercise. Okay. I should say that, okay, so this is the conclusion, uh, you know, from that uh, short piece of analysis, that royalty payments are unlikely to exceed the minimum guarantee payment. Uh, even, you know, 
if something crazy happened to the power price and they go really high and you think that the royalty payment would be really high to you, then they still have the alternative rent, this mechanism to cap the amount of the royalty payment. So you won't reap the full benefit of really high energy prices. So just so that you know, be realistic, think that, you know, look at the minimum payment, look at the maximum payment, and this is the, you know, in expectation, what, what you will get. I should say that, you know, the minimum payment, is it a good or a bad number? Well, you know, if I kind of reverse engineer, I do the production disruption, uh, I, you know, I do those adjustments and so on, I see, what is the implied power price that, you know, is proposed by the minimum payment? Well, it's about $65 per megawatt, which is, I think, pretty fair and pretty high given where the prices, where the prices are. Okay? So I'm not saying that the, those days are unfair and they don't offer a good economic value for, for what they are, but I'm just saying that maybe they are not as nice and shiny that, as they, they look. Okay? I feel that you know, the minimum payment is still quite a bit generous given the, what we see in the market for electricity. Okay. What about solar? Much simpler leases uh, in terms of the economic of it. Usually this is a large, large signing bonus, so larger than wind, and then they will pay you for the number of acres uh, that they will use to install the operation. Okay, so ten sometimes this is a per acre, sometimes they'll say, okay, we want a minimum of five acres and we'll pay you ten ten thousand dollar a year or something like that. So sometimes they link this is per acres or this is kind of a lump sum payment and they require a minimum amount of acres, okay? So I think the issue here is to just be clear of how much land they can access. So this is more a legal issue uh, given what they, they send the lease. Uh, and then how much you receive from those uh, contracts is just, okay, $10,000 a year. So what you need to do to determine is it a fair value? Well, again, think of when will be that first payment, okay? How long it will take to the operation to, to start operation will it take four, five, ten years, okay? And then sum that amount, $10,000 a year, $10,000 a year, uh, times 20 years, but discount that amount with your favorite discount rate, okay? Much less volatility, economic risk, uh, and then, okay, so then the question that I'm asking is like, well, suppose that you install two megawatt on 10, 10 uh, acres and they pay you $10,000 for that. Is it, I mean, how much money they are making out of that and are they giving you kind of a, a fair share of the pie in this case? So what I did, so I did the following thought experiment. I took the wind lease and I took the same percentage in terms of royalty payment, okay? 3% was the, the percentage uh, of the royalty payment. And I said, what is the implied value of electricity that $10,000 a year for a two megawatt operation will give you? Okay. If, so you know, by the start experiment, if I find a really high power price, it means that they, they give you kind of a, you know, a high, high price or a good value for the, the land that they are using. If this is a low price, it means that they give you a really small piece of the pie. Okay. So, you know, made small assumption, gross capacity, what we see on average in the US, uh, I've adjusted for production disruption, curtailment a little bit, uh, I could play with that. But what I'm finding is the implied power price by a lease that will pay you $10,000 a year using 10 acres and that will install two megawatt using the royalty payment of a wind lease imply a power price in the, ra the range of $90 to $150, okay? Now the market price is 30 these days. Something that you should know, if electricity supplier doesn't meet the RPS, they have to pay a fee of $300, 350 per megawatt hour. So I think, you know, to have a sense of, is it a big or you know, a small number? Well, this is higher than the, market price, so it seems that this is a fair value, but this is you know, quite a bit smaller than the penalty that the, the energy supplier will pay if they don't meet the RPS policy. Long story short, I feel that, you know, like for wind, the minimum guarantee payment, 
this is kind of a, a payment that reflect. Uh, this is, seems to be a fair payment, to from from what I see and what I understand from the from the market. Okay, so they give you kind of a a decent share of the pie of the money that they are making from those operations, so that you know. Okay. Could you expand a little bit on that last one or uh, not complying with RPS solar farm? What, what would that entail? So, okay, energy suppliers uh, need. Let's go back to the example. They have to have a uh, BGE will sell 100 units of energy. 20% of it needs to be from RPS. So they have to have 20, 20 recs. If for some reason at the end of the year BGE has only 10 recs and they have no intention to, to buy more recs, the regulator will say, okay, well, you have to pay uh, 350. I'm recognizing that's only for a solar rack, and that number changes over time. So that's right. in 2019, it's going to be down to $150, yep. and by about 230, it's going to be down to like $50. Thank you. And having said that, the uh, price of a wreck has never come close yep. to what the alternative compliance thing is. Yep. So that's right. So what will happen? In, yeah. So that is only for solar, and this is the price that we have now, and this there's a, yeah, a decrease in that price. And uh, yeah, the idea is that the. The energy supplier will say, okay, now the price of Rex, market price, $50 in the state, 40, 30 change, but they will pay, they will buy just more Rex on the market instead of paying them. Okay, uh, I'm done discussing those leases. Just further thought, uh, you know, again, so that you know. In the state, there is what we call a net metering policy. It means that if you install solar panel on the roof of your, on your barn, on your house. Basically, you are setting back that electricity to the grid, and the price that you receive for that is the average price that you have paid in the last, in the last year. Okay? And given the trends that we see in the technology, the price of solar panel, given the price that we see in Maryland for electricity, and the price that you have probably paid in the last year, I encourage you to look at those options. If you think, if you are thinking about solar, you know, renewable energy, and you know, as investment, installing, you know, small, uh, small scale renewable energy on your on your roof, on the barn, uh, on your farm operation, might be a pretty good investment given those policies. So, it depends. It's a site specific, but this is something that you should spend some time thinking of if you are thinking also about large scale solar. Okay. So this is, uh, the long story short, the economic of it start, start to be uh, really good and look pretty, pretty nice. So this is maybe something that you might want to do. OK, I'm done. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please send me an email. Uh, you can contact Jenny. I'll be happy to, to talk uh, with you. And now Paul will discuss uh, the legal issues uh, associated with those leases. Thank you.